Oscar goes to. And the Oscar goes to. The Oscar goes to. And the Oscar goes to. And the Oscar goes to. Hernán Braverman. I have just turned 50. And one of the best surprises I received was the invitation to be part of the Pentaworth jury. Since its launch, the Pentaworth is often referred as the Oscars of the packaging design industry. Nowadays, it would be wiser to consider it the United Nations of packaging design. With the competition now in its 16th year, since launch it has received in excess of 20,000 entries from over 64 countries with the winners showcasing some of the world's most innovative, inspiring and powerful packaging design. The Penta Wars is no longer just a celebration. It is a prime source of inspiration for connecting the global packaging community. Packaging design should seduce, inform and even save the planet. I'm Hernán Braverman, and this is Branderman, the podcast where I talk with experts to uncover what it actually takes to make a positive impact on consumers, the market, and society. Warning, keep this podcast out of the reach of close-minded marketers and designers. Before the interview, let me introduce my design agency. Brands with purpose. Human, agile, honest brands that leave no one indifferent. Tridimage creates and revitalizes brands to imagine and shape the future. Tridimage, the branding and packaging design agency for bold brands. Today I had the pleasure to speak with Adam Ryan, a British designer and currently head of Pentawards, the most prestigious global packaging design competition. Adam joined the Pentawars team in February of 2017. He studied graphic design at the London College of Printing before becoming a fashion designer and creative consultant for several international brands. Adam has a wealth of experience across various industries, which include fashion, design, branding, marketing and events. He's also one of the main contributors to the package design book series published by Taschen. In this episode, we discuss the challenges and opportunities he faces while managing the world's most recognized packaging design competition. He also tells me what he has learned from producing the first Pentawars Trends report and shares why we need to create a sustainable valley for packaging. Today with me, Adam Ryan. Adam, each of us is a container of ideas, projects, and dreams. However, we can't read the label when we are inside the jar. What do you think your label says, or what would you like it to say? Well, what a magnificent question. I've never been asked this before, so thank you for making me think about that. If I'm looking at it from a Pentacles perspective as an organization, the label would say something like, we're committed to organizing and recognizing excellence in design, providing a sort of inspiration and connecting the packaging design community. And I think to throw a little few things in there, no added salt, sprinkles of success and winning mentality, and to try and help the future generation of packaging design. Building a brand is like a journey. It starts with defining where we are and asking ourselves where we want to go. What was the path that led you from studying graphic design in London to becoming head of Pent Awards? Today is actually my five-year anniversary at Pentawards. <laughs> Happy so <this> anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. It's, this it's is very timely. good timing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just did a post on LinkedIn. And the way I got to being head of Pentawards is very not traditional. And I'll go back first. So as a child, all I wanted to do was play football and draw. When I went to college, I was very good at art, graphics, and media. But I, I did struggle a bit with English and history. But I always knew there was something within me that was quite creative. So I did go to university and study graphic design at London College of Printing. And when I finished university, I don't know why I did this, but I jumped into a life of 
trying to be an entrepreneur with no work experience, which was a, a steep learning curve. And I launched my own clothing label and quickly recognized that I really enjoyed events and designing. But after doing the design for a while and not making a lot of money, I pursued a, a path of putting on live events, working with brands, doing consultancy work. And after a while of working in this industry, I had to make a few different decisions about my career path. And I thought as well as try and be an entrepreneur, I actually needed some raw help in terms of running a business and, and working for a larger business. So I, I decided to apply for some roles. And after three months, I wasn't that successful. And I got offered a temporary role at Easy Fairs to do admin, administration. Yeah. And Easy Fairs is a global exhibition business that actually owned Pensworld. So I, I was only meant to be here for two weeks doing administration, <laughs> calling visitors to the shows to attend, to give them information. And luckily, the environment here and the people were really, really good. And I got talking to the CEO of the business. I, I made him a cup of tea and I went in very nervously to give him this cup of tea. And he asked me about my background and he told me they just acquired a business called Pentawards. When I heard about the role and the job, it kind of really worked well for my experience in terms of somebody that could build a brand, could do some marketing, had some sales experience, enjoyed design. And I remember going through the interview process and I had three really tough interviews and they offered me the job and I still wasn't sure because I'd always worked in fashion or more kind of brand related events. And I went away and thought about it and, and the culture and team at Easy Fairs was something that really interested me and it was a new opportunity and, and all that doubt I let go and I jumped in and fast forward five years, I'm now the head of Pentwoods when I was only meant to be here for two weeks. <laughs> and if you could travel back in time and give some advice to that rookie Adam, what would it be? Brilliant question. Tried to set in doubt as in I made excuses for maybe not to do the temporary administration role. So I said to myself, It's an admin role. I wanted a managerial job. It was too far from where I live. There was no parking. It's packaging. I didn't know anything about it. But again, I'd go back and say, stop overthinking and just put yourself into a situation to try something new because you don't know what's going to happen. And actually, I look back to five years ago and I say to myself, well done for taking that chance and, and making your boss a cup of tea. So that's a good hint for everybody. <laughs> Make tea for your boss because you get to talk. <laughs> And what do you understand about package design now that you didn't understand before your Penta work experience? How has your vision of packaging design evolved? Great. Your questions are amazing. This is why I love this podcast. When I first started, and again, having no experience of packaging design, the only thing that kind of resonates with me when thinking about packaging before I worked at Pensworld was I used to keep my trainers in the trainer boxes because I felt that it added more value or having a wine bottle where I turned it into a candle holder. That was the only thing I'd ever realized in terms of packaging. It wasn't something that played a part in my life before I started at Pentawards. So when I started at Pentawards, I started my degree in learning more about packaging design, the life degree. At that time, when I joined five years ago, something I learned from people outside of Pentawards is that it was a bit of a beauty parade. Okay, so it was all about how beautiful the piece of packaging was. And I remember when I was learning the process of the business and talking to the individuals, and, and it's not only about that finished article, and it's not only about being beautiful, it's about actually a deeper meaning, how it can create real purpose, how it can influence sales, how it can influence individuals, how it can be inclusive, it can be sustainable. And I think from my understanding now compared to five years ago, Packaging is not just a piece of beauty, it's it multifaceted, it's an array of different things. And I've certainly learned over the years now that even within our competition, we can't just focus on that. And that's why we've brought in different judging criteria and looked at new categories like sustainable design as an example. What are the challenges and opportunities you face while managing the world's most recognized packaging design award? when any brand owner or a project comes your way, you kind of have to try and retain the heritage, but move it into the future. Or in my case, it was the 21st century. So a challenge was this amazing award that many people had followed for you know over 10 years was going to be changing. And I had the pressure to make sure that it did retain that heritage and it was moved into the 21st century and retained its community and not changing too much. And I learned 
every detail about the business. So when I first started and when Easy Fares ever acquired a business for the first year, we don't make any changes. And that gave me an opportunity to learn the business inside out. But in the back of my mind, I had a million new ideas. I had a million new things I wanted to introduce, but it was done in a very tasteful, timely way, a respective way to the founders who stayed on board for a few years and, and educated me and, and gave me lots of inside knowledge. And then when it was time to make changes, I think one of the first things I implemented was the jury. So my first year in 2017, I remember looking at the jury. It was 10 male Europeans <laughs> that didn't reflect the community and the, and the global reach. And now I'm overjoyed that you're part of this year's jury. We've got 50 individuals from over 20 countries, a great mixture of females and males from different design disciplines and backgrounds and experience. And for me, this just makes it one of the best competitions in the world because of the jury being at the center of that. Yeah. Adam, tell me about some of your favorite all-time experiences and anecdotes of leading Pent Awards. There's been so many to think about over the five years. But for me, the biggest thing that I feel that I could look back and really be proud about and experience is that Pent Awards, when I started, had no social media. It was only known as a competition. And I think now if you think of Pentwoods, it's certainly more than that. It's the platform. It's a community. It's where if you want to know more about packaging design, you can go to as a source, as, a, as an inspiration. And for me, it, I've only just got started. Even though it's been five years, I'm now at a stage where I'm like, okay, we've achieved all this. We've connected the community, but what's next? And for me, it's about new initiatives helping students from low-income backgrounds, searching out for the best packaging designers in the world. And, and we me and you had a conversation for email a couple of weeks ago where you suggested, Adam, there's some amazing design hubs around the world, but they might not be able to afford to enter the competition. One thing I would say is that we always listen to this feedback and we always try to implement new things to help the community and to find the best work and to find the best designers It's a level playing field. It doesn't matter if you're a freelancer or a small design agency against the big design agency, the best work will win. But ultimately, if you're not interested in entering the competition, is there a source of information? Is there an archive? Is there something that can help them on a new project going forward? So for me, it's about building this great platform, which we're not only known as a competition. Yeah, yeah. Besides the usual suspects, which countries or regions surprise you with their creativity? So a few not kind of traditionally recognized countries that you'd go, oh, they're really known for design that stand out to me. There's two really. Um, I'd say the main one is China. China, if you're thinking about stereotypes in the past, some people might say that it copies the work. Okay. Yeah. But now, certainly, if you look at the designs coming from China, they are creating absolutely unbelievable design, especially in different categories within spirits and food and other markets. And they're certainly now somebody to keep an eye on. Whereas in the past, you might think their design's influence from Europe. They're definitely having their own stamp on design. Another amazing place is Armenia, who yeah. have won the Design Agency of the Year a few times in the past few years. And the usual suspects like, you know, the UK, America, um, the Netherlands, Spain, really up in all their games as well. Again, it's a capital and it's a place where you would never think of to be, a, you know, a traditional design hub. Sure. But I love yeah. seeing that. What, in your opinion, sets apart an award-winning packaging design from a good one? I would say now it's about the purpose of the packaging. It's about what else it does. Is it solving an issue? Is it bringing something more? So as an example, I know the jury now, even though it's not in our judging criteria, but they might say, say a food entry, they might say, oh, but is this sustainable? And that, that is, for me, coming into the conversation more and more and more. And I think businesses and brands who kind of reuse their own waste, who are sustainable, that are using, say, e-commerce in a, an immersive way or serving a real purpose, they understand the consumer's mindset or they're being inclusive their kind of projects are now getting more noticed than the ones that are really succeeding in the competition. And for that, I'm actually super, super excited about seeing this year's entries and what's going to be shortlisted and win. Could you talk us through the Pent Awards judging process? 
Yeah, great. Yeah, sure. It's changed from the old founders going through the entries and taking some out and then shortlist a number of entries for the jury to then judge. So now what we've done is that every piece of work entered isn't then kind of looked at by my team, the Pentals team. We don't touch any of the entries. Mm -hmm. So that basically means all the judging is done by the jury. And we know that judging is subjective. Design is subjective. Something I like, you might might not like. So now round one is done online. Every piece of work entered is judged by some jury members. And what happens in that judging process online is that they review the images and the descriptions and the jury members will score out of 20 from four different criteria from emotional connection to innovation to the graphics or the creative as used. And what happens at the end of it, in that round one, every single person gets a score out of 20. So then they can see in those four criteria where they can improve. It's where they might be doing very well. Because we know whenever you enter a competition, it's about the feedback. We're not quite at the stage to give written feedback because we have over 2,000 entries wow. every year. And you can imagine if you had to judge 2,000 entries, you, <laughs> your head would fall off. So then the first round, the, the entries that get the most points are shortlisted and it's at round two that we ask for physical samples and again a selection of jury come touch fill the packaging make sure that they agree they debate they have to have a, a unanimous decision on the winners and from that we choose our winners so it's quite a long process like to win a pensworld it's not easy but ultimately it's down to the jury members and all work is private and confidential when the judges are judging they don't know if it's from a Pearl Fisher or a freelancer. So it's a level playing field and the best work wins. That's great. How is the jury selected? So the jury selected, it's changed again. So it used to be if you were a gold winner or above and the president and us would reach out, discuss and see if there would be an interest there. But what we've certainly done over the last few years is that you don't have to be a Pentwood gold winner because there might be a silver winner. There might be an individual that can enter the competition, but they do outstanding work. And we get hundreds of applications each year, which is reviewed. But we try and keep a nice mixture of individuals from across the globe. We try and get representation from Asia, from Americas, from Europe. It's important to have that nice diverse mix. It's really important when it comes to judging. And I'm delighted you said yes. And I know you're a... <laughs> a long-term winner and a supporter of Pentwoods. It's also important that somebody understands our business and kind of wants to be inspired by the entries and enjoys the work because it's your time. It's that you're giving that up to judge the best work from across the world. And it means the most to the people that enter to get that feedback and for you to see their work. Winning a PENT award represents a career pinnacle for many creatives, especially since the international jury that awards the winners is made up of their peers. Adam, what can we expect to find at the PENT awards festival this year? Good question. Well, you're getting an exclusive right now. So wow. <laughs> this is where I'm focusing majority of my time right now on the strategy and, and the idea for this. So over the last two years, we've hosted something called the Pentwoods Festival online, a digital version, which has worked during COVID. But I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to do a physical Pentwoods Festival. And at this moment in time, we're conducting hundreds of interviews and surveys with the community to find out what they want from this festival. And it will be a two-day event, a conference, networking, workshops. And at the end of the second day, it will be our gala ceremony where we reveal this year's winners. So for me, it's an opportunity to get in the same room as some of the world's biggest brands, for you to network, for you to talk to people in the same boat as you and you to be able to say to somebody, you know, what's keeping your awake at night and sharing opinions and ideas and again to discuss if there's any new initiatives we should be working on but I'm really really super excited about bringing the world's biggest speakers and, and having this global meeting point to discuss packaging yeah. design and, and the future. That's great because I remember when I had the chance to attend the gala in Barcelona I think that one of the parts that I enjoyed the most was the networking after the, the prize givings and it's great that that networking could be extended to two days so that's that's super cool. Thank you. Thank you. 
A great number of Pent Awards winners are from emerging or niche brands. How can we find the harmony between creativity and commerciality for established brands? Why do you think larger brands do not usually dare to do something different to the industry norm? This kind of caveats nicely into a trend report we just created. And one of the main things that we pointed out was that a trend we're seeing, especially in this current climate, is surprising takes on traditional packs. And sometimes these large brands or corporations dare not to change because they've got a product, they've got certain logistics and certain manufacturing already set up. So it's difficult for them to make them changes, whereas a new brand has that flexibility to try something new, to learn new innovations, to try and set up new manufacturing plants or systems. And I salute the brands now that are agreeing to these new approaches, to being a little bit more disruptive, to trying something new. And, and I think actually that's something that designers have always had. And it's very inspiring that these new ideas are being pushed and actually getting into the market, especially fast moving goods larger brands and corporations could certainly lead the way for some change because they've got the finance or revenues. But it seems that newer brands have the opportunity to be more free. Yeah. Mentioning the Penta Wars Trends report, are there any overall themes and trends you have observed with the competition entries? How would you define the creative zeitgeist? The zeitgeist now is really impressive In that trend report, we looked at all of the entries, 2,000 entries, and actually putting together a trend report was something we'd never done before because in a way, when I was talking at the beginning of this podcast, you know, I've now worked at Pentwoods for five years and I still have this bit of imposter syndrome, but <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't because I've seen tens of thousands of pieces of packaging over the years. I'm, I'm sorry, as my team. So the way we analyze the entries, you can start seeing which kind of typography is being repeated or colors or themes. We've chosen 10 from highlighting mental health to diversity, inclusivity, to sustainability. And for me, the strongest one, which I'm going to make a bit of a, a controversial statement is <laughs> over the last three years, and I'm sure in your business, you've seen this, whenever you get a brief, everybody's asking, Can I have it sustainable? Can it be made sustainable? Yeah, right? sure. Yeah. And what, what I'm seeing now is that certainly there's this thing which is being more focused on inclusivity. And what, what I mean by that is designing for more than one group. And if you can design for more than one group and everybody buys it, you're making real difference. So as an example, Super Studio based in Spain, who you probably know well, Paco yeah, Adin and his team, they did this wonderful project for coffee where it was called Only For Your Eyes, okay? And this packaging that they designed uses Braille, but when you're looking at it as a consumer, you can still read it and see what it says. And you <laughs> know it's Braille, and it's this beautiful pink and blue contrast. And it, you, you're just ultimately, the emotional connection, you're sucked into it. And there are some statistics that you know, globally now, there's one billion people with disabilities So why are they not being included in some of the designs and packaging that's being created? And if you can do that, and to me, it can appeal, and I'm not blind, you're doing something tremendous for design. So I think this inclusivity topic is going to be very, very poignant and be one of the new zeitgeists over the next few years. Adam, I guess you have met a lot of renowned designers. If you could have dinner with any three designers, dead or alive, who would they be and why? Oh my God. No, it doesn't have to only be in packaging. It can be no, in no. any design. Any, any design. Okay. Oh, this, I've never been asked this before. Good question. <laughs> so it's me and you are both there and three other people. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and three others. So it's me and you. We're having a dinner party. Three other people. Okay. Thanks first for the invitation. One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first person that springs to mind is Alexandra McQueen. Yeah. He was from Stratford where I also grew up and I just think how he approached design and his collections and also his backstory is, is beautiful and, and amazing and unfortunately he's no longer with us but his fashion house and brand still lives on and there's an amazing documentary about McQueen and I which I'd recommend anybody to go and watch. That's number one. Number two, thinking about the Pentawards Festival When I created this concept three years ago, I had to write some potential speakers. 
And my first person that I put on that was Virgil Abloh, who, again, unfortunately passed away not long ago. But I just love his creative mind, the things that he's achieved, the partnerships that he did. I have his newest book, which he created with Tashan. Mm. And there was nobody that looked like him or acted like him. And he had to create this new wave of an influencer who a designer and creative director could be and look like. So for me, that'd be number two. Yeah. Number three. Oh my God, this is a tough one. I'll, I'll go for a really out of the box one. I said at the beginning of this podcast that I, I love football. When I was younger, I played a lot of football and I was a goalkeeper. My idol was David Seaman when he played for yeah. England in Euro 96, right? Yeah. And I've got back into football kits and vintage football kits. And I will never forget because it was one of the first goalkeeper shirts that I bought. It was the Euro 96 England home goalkeeper kit, which was this yellow, green, purple, red. Mm. It was really wild and outlandish in the design. And I recently bought it again, a vintage one, which I just love because I love the design. And it just reminded me of as a child and growing up and playing football with no stress. And I'd love to meet the designer of that jersey. And in fact, after this, I'm going to have to research who it was because I actually don't know. <laughs> we should organize a football match in the festival. Yeah, amazing. But I have to be on your team because the South Americans have got a lot of skill and we need that. <laughs> I have European roots and that has affected my abilities. <laughs> I'm much better <laughs> in package design than in football. Exactly. Well, your package design certainly is very skillful and spicy. So thank you. <laughs> Um, what is the worst packaging design crime you have ever seen or perhaps committed? Mm. When I think about an individual design, there's something overarching that I don't agree with, and that is this topic on greenwashing or overpackaging. Mm. If there's a brand or a product that isn't the most sustainable, the best thing that they could do is be honest and hold their hands up and then work on improving And actually, over the last week, there's been a design which is affiliated with uh, Morrison's in the UK, which is yep. a supermarket here, which is turning these plastic milk bottles into Tetra packs. And actually, they've said it's 100% recyclable, and it, it isn't. And it's really bad. It's getting a lot mm. of negative press. And it's terrible what's coming out because they've not obviously done their research on the different materials and if it is more recyclable or not. And this does come back to this whole conversation around people knowing what sustainability is and not. So for me, it's any piece or product that is greenwashing without the actual intent that it can help the environment. The future is that we've got to create packaging and there'll be materials that aren't even designed yet that will have a positive effect on the environment, not negative. Do you think immersive and connected technologies will rewrite the rules of package design? Will we be able to differentiate between physical and digital design or will it be one and the same? We're in a world of the golden digital age yeah. and we are seeing more and more packs that are augmented or QR codes that give you information about the product and you can connect to the storytelling of it. When you're designing now as designers, you're certainly thinking about what it looks like online and that has to really jump out to a consumer. And also there's many more direct to consumer brands launching. So sometimes your first interaction with that brand will be online on Instagram. And then when you would get that delivered to your home, it's kind of the shop front of that brand is the emotional connection with that brand. And the packaging is the number one thing that's going to really help promote that business. Obviously, if you look at the statistics of people shopping online, it's, it's gone up hugely since the pandemic. But I don't think it's the same way as comparing listening to your favorite musician or band on your phone compared to going to see it live in the flesh. Mm -hmm. It's an experience. It's, a, it's real. It appeals to your senses. As designers and brands now, they're going to be thinking a lot more about that digital space. But obviously, it has to work digitally and physically. Do you think Latin American designers can bring a new perspective to the world of package design? Absolutely. I want to spend more time in Latin America. I want to get under the skin and learn more about what's going on there. We're certainly getting some incredible work coming from that part of the world. Yeah, I think it's innovative, it's creative, it's distinct, it's very expressionistic, it's incredible. Design sometimes is certain to a certain demographic, the story, the heritage 
the way it's approached is really important. And Latin America has a great approach. I'd like to see more work from that part of the world into our competition, but we haven't got any live events there. We haven't done a gala ceremony there. I am certainly thinking about connecting with that audience in a way that we haven't done before. So now on our website, as an example, we have the website in Spanish. But yeah. Do I need to organize an event which is in Spanish? Do we look at our entry forms? Do we look at a wider way of attracting more design from Latin America so we can showcase this wonderful collective of designers and influence? Adam, what is the one common myth about packaging design that you want to debunk? Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing question. I think number one, that packaging design sometimes isn't seen to be a design discipline, which is credible. People tend to think studying graphic design or product design or another type of design is more important. And I'm not saying it's not. I just think that packaging sometimes gets put further down the pecking order of a priority. However, if I look at my jewelry, so many people have studied industrial design or product design or graphic design, and they've gone into this space where they're like, it's the only space they ever want to work in. So for me, it's an incredible design discipline. It's full of some beautiful individuals and designers that really can change the landscape of this world. It needs to be up there as one of the best. <laughs> What breakthrough would you like to see in the packaging design field in the near future? Yeah, I think that the breakthrough is how we can make things more sustainable, actually more sustainable. And that's going to mean, for example, you know, there's a Silicon Valley for technology. And I feel that there needs to be a sustainable valley that works on new innovations and new materials and, and new design approaches that can help drive this issue forward. Because it's still, after so many years, a bit confusing for everybody. And it doesn't only mean from a side of design and the brands, but also for the consumer to actually follow the instructions and, and to make a difference. If you could just take a pill and learn any subject, anything, what would it be? I'd love to be able to speak every language, mm. every language, because I'm in a team of people that speak multiple different languages. And unfortunately, I only speak English. Mm. And I'd love to be able to have conversations with designers all over the world about their approaches and their methods. And I'm restricted to just learning that in English or subtitles, which sometimes doesn't always give you that expression or enthusiasm. So if I could speak every language to then go to every country and to learn more and spend a period of time there and, and just keep learning, that would be something that I would really love. <laughs> Adam, what is your next adventure? My next adventure is continuing to grow Pentacles to be more than just a competition. My kind of focus for the next year is certainly this Pentacles Festival and making it the best experience for people that attend and leave there with a memory forever. A personal one that I'm making a high priority is helping students get into this industry and understanding why certain demographics aren't. Helping people from low-income backgrounds, helping students get placements and to be inspired to come into the packaging design industry. Adam, thanks for this award-winning conversation. You are, without doubt, the United Nations Packaging Design Ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put that on my Instagram description. <laughs> that will be fair. Thank you so much for the invite. Thank you for everything you do for our industry as well. For this podcast, it's beautiful. Anyone listening, please listen to the other episodes. And thank you for being part of our jury. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> Gracias. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. You can check the episode notes for all the relevant links. I also invite you to follow me on Instagram and on my website, branderman.design. Follow the podcast in your favorite app so you don't miss the next episode of Branderman, the podcast where we try to uncover how to make a positive impact on consumers, the market and society through package design.